Much appreciated. Thank you. And yes. um, thank you, Professor Katani, for uh, the invitation to speak here today. Um, my computer decided to just restart on me uh, about a minute ago. I was making some very funny sounds. So hopefully this all works. Um, it's yeah. not the battery. I can tell you that much. It's not the battery. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay. So I'd like to give you a bit of a, I think there's been some really nice talks by Professor Chen and um, Professor Cartini um, uh, on, on uh, I get the, the, the materials and the characterization tools. I think I'd like to put it all together um, and sort of lead in and, and sort of fuse it all together. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking about the chemistry of ba batteries um, and I have some strong Indonesian connections in my group. So Lisa, who's just finished up her PhD, just submitted. Um, is from Indonesia and James who finished his PhD. Uh, one of my first students is also from Indonesia. So I have some strong Indonesian ties in my group. Um, I have to get some, I have to get a new one to replace Lisa now uh, too. So if you're interested, send me an email. Um, yeah, uh, so what we do is we, I'm a chemist. And so what I'm interested in is what happens inside a battery and how to make better batteries from the materials point of view. And so what you're seeing here is a, a neutron diffraction pattern, intensity versus two theta, as we charge and discharge a battery. So it's an in-situ experiment, right? And as you charge and discharge a battery, you can see all these changes. And these changes are related to essentially how the cathode and the anode, the crystalline components evolve as we charge and discharge. So if you look at this peak here, it's actually graphite. Um, and the graphite evolving. And this peak here is, in this case, lithium cobalt oxide. And you can see it moving as you charge and discharge. And I'll, I'll show you more about that as we go along. So this is a, a figure I like to use, um, quite an important aspect of our lives these days. Um, not necessarily, you know, so it, it, it's quite an important part. I don't think I need to motivate why we do battery research, um, but I can also just, just give you a bit more detail on, on what it looks like inside a battery. And I think the talks before me were pretty uh, pretty insightful. Um, essentially, it's your lithium ions transporting or shuttling between your anode and your cathode um, via an electrolyte. But when you look at it in a, in a bit more detail, you find that each component here is actually quite complicated. Uh, the, the cathode is made up of current, the actual active material, the lithium conducting material, uh, the conductors, a binder, uh, the electrolyte has a few additives in there to make it nice. You have all these surface layers in there. Um, and then you also have various particle sizes. So it becomes from a simple, this material to a very convoluted system, right? So you've got 20 or so different components in there working in unison to, to, to give you your power and your energy. And you can also replace lithium with sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, if you wish. Uh, we saw an excellent talk earlier from the sodium-based work. So if we want to probe this, and you can imagine that you've got nanoscale, you've got crystalline materials, and you've got liquid materials, you've got surface effects, there's a whole bunch of different things that are occurring. So if you really want to probe this, you really need to think about what length you're going to look at, what time you're going to look at, and what sort of uh, information you want, all right? So whether you're looking at local information, crystalline information, nanoscale ordering and fabrication, right? So which components are you interested in and how are you going to find out about that? Some of the surface considerations, right? Are the surfaces uh, active, non-active? Some of the dynamic considerations, you know, how do I transport lithium or sodium from one site to the other? Do I look at the atomic scale approach or do I look at more of the bulk approach, right? And so, Choosing the right scale and often multiple scales to characterize the materials and characterize the materials in devices is ideal. Okay, so a lot of work in my group has been this long range order, uh, so crystalline materials in full cells, uh, but we are also doing a lot more on local information using solid state NMR, um, pair distribution function analysis, and also dynamics using spectroscopy. So inelastic and quasi elastic neutron spectroscopy, Raman spectroscopy, things like this. So if you look at the crystalline materials, or if we're just focusing on long range order and fabrication, we're clearly looking at um, crystal structure, its evolution, the types of reactions that are occurring and its relationship to properties. So if you look at a voltage versus time graph, in order to have the best battery, you want basically the highest voltage and for this to long, last as long as you can, 
and to be as reproducible as possible. So on this charge or charge, you want it to be as reproducible as possible. If you look at this spinel structure, so this is the lithiated structure, so you can see the lithium in green here, and this is the delithiated, so the lithium is being taken out, right? You could say, all right, well, these are the two channels that I'm looking at. So if I make them bigger or if I make them hold more lithium, I could increase the capacity or I can make it go faster or slower, right? But if you look at a, a pattern somewhere in the middle here, you realize that actually it's not just one site coming in and out, but there's a pathway. There's actually a lithium pathway coming in and out. And so you have to tune your structure to optimize that pathway, okay? And so, this is a crystalline image as well. So this is a static picture. You want to might look at you might want to look at dynamics to see how that pathway evolves and what things are helping that pathway or not helping that pathway. So having this atomic scale picture of a material, ideally in a device, is fantastic to sort of really understand what's happening and then to build better devices. So what I do is I use neutrons in battery research and I use X-rays in battery research. Why do I use neutrons and X-rays? Well, this is a picture of my family um, in Hawaii. There's a volcano there. Um, and essentially um, what you can see here in the day, you can't see the volcano at night. We are here, you can see the volcano. It's all about contrast, right? So neutrons give you some contrast, X-rays give you other contrast, right? So X-rays interact with your electrons. So the heavier it is, an element is there, the stronger the signal typically. Neutrons, it's a nuclear interaction and it's a bit more, um, variable as you go across the periodic table, okay? But neutrons are very good for lithium um, and really probing lithium. Uh, there's not that many techniques out there that are that sensitive to lithium and neutrons are very good for this. So if you think about diffraction and long range order, if you've got a single crystalline material, you can get beautiful single crystal diffraction data, which you can then do to unambiguously solve a crystal structure. Right? So you can look at the lattice parameters, you can look at what atoms are there, solve the structure. Once you go from single crystal to a powder, right, you now are fitting a model to the data. So the model is this model here, um, and it's the black line. The red crosses are the data, um, and the purple here is the difference. So this is called a Rietveld um, refinement. And essentially what we're doing is we're refining the model to fit the data. So it's not unambiguous, right? It's a model to the data. Okay, and you can sort of see here we're now sort of you know we're we're making approximations, we're doing modeling and, and that sort of things. And when you start thinking about in situ work, you have a very complex system, right? There's multiple components in there. Uh, in particular, the cathode, the anode, the crystalline. There's amorphous components, right? So you're now fitting multiple models to one set of data, and the data is then evolving as you charge and discharge, right? So it becomes a lot more complex, but if you can see what's happening, you can really find out what's happening, not just as one charge discharge cycle, but as different discharge charge discharge cycles, different current rates, different temperatures. You can do a lot more work with parameter space, as long as you can get the models right, as long as you can get the data quality good enough or brilliant if you can. The great thing about batteries is there's only a few things that are crystalline. So diffraction is quite good because it's sensitive to those materials as long as you can keep the background out, okay? So we like doing this type of work and this is sort of a snapshot of all sort of, this is mostly synchrotron X-ray work we've been doing. Um, the neutrons, I'm not allowed to take photos as much. So I don't take photos. With the X-rays, I can take photos. Um, so if we walk through it, right, we have a battery in the discharge state and a charge state. So this is a commercial battery. I love showing this uh, page, if you've seen it before, I do apologize. It's really informative on the process. So you've got the charge, discharged, and this is a battery I've bought off um, the internet, right? Um, you can sort of see there are differences. What we can then do is we can uh, model it. So we've got aluminium and copper, which are your current collectors. We've got graphite, two different forms of graphite, and lithium cobalt oxide. In this case, this is just a label fit. And you can sort of see here, this is our model to the data. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take this part and I'm going to squash it down. So this will be intense and this will be uh, not so intense. So this will be blue, right? And I'm going to plot it as a function of time. So what we've done is, I'll come back to that. What we've done here is we've got 500 data sets or so. Um, and what we're doing is we're taking this section. This peak here is that peak there. This peak here 
is this peak here, right? And what we're doing here is essentially discharging, charging, discharging, charging, discharging, charging, and so on and so forth, right? Based on our analysis, we can identify which one's the cathode and which one's the anode. So this is lithium cobalt oxide. It's a layered structure, and this is the stacking axis, which is this axis up here, right? And this is graphite, and this is, again, the stacking axis, right? So what you can see with lithium cobalt oxide is it's a solid solution reaction. It just expands and contracts as you charge and discharge. For graphite, similar sort of thing, expands and contracts, but then you have a two-phase reaction, so you nucleate a second phase. Actually, if you go slower in graphite, you see the staged intercalation if you want to. So if you use a lower current rate, faster current rate, the structural transitions are faster. So what you can also do is get both structural information and kinetic information. So how fast the structure changes as a function of how much current you apply, right? So if you double the current, does the structural change change by twice as much or is it less than that, right? So that's the variability in there as well. Okay, so let's have another look at some of the examples. So uh, Prof. Kata, Prof Katani was talking about NMC. This is an example where we're looking at NMC, right? We're looking at the different compositions of MSC and we're doing in situ experiments. And what we're seeing here is the change in cell volume, right? So that's the lattice parameters as a function of voltage, right? So what you can see almost immediately is some compositions have a big change in uh, uh, volume, right? This 8, 811, which is the highest capacity typically, but has the largest volume change. And you can imagine if this is in a battery and it's changing quite a fair bit, right? This really affects the lifetime, right? And you can make a beautiful phase diagram as we saw earlier, and you can sort of see the percentage change in vo cell volume as a function of composition. You, see, you want to be over here in terms of volume um, to minimize those changes, maybe have a li longer lifetime battery. But this one here gives you the most capacity, right? So it's a bit of a, a double-edged sword, it's a conundrum. Which one's the best choice? Yeah, Longer lasting battery, more capacity. Ideally, you want best of both worlds. So what else you can do is you can understand what happens at higher voltage. So if you go to 4.7 volts or higher voltage, you can get more lithium out, so larger energy density, but does it cause a bigger change in structure, right? And so you can do this, you can look at how stable it is at high voltages, and you can make a similar sort of thing in terms of how much change does the, the cell volume change as a function of holding it at a certain voltage? So we're just doing a potential static hold, so holding it at a voltage, and we're just looking at how much from here onwards the volume changes. And you can sort of see again, the 811 has the largest change, yet it has the largest capacity, right? So it's a, it's a bit of an interesting thing, but we can actually then go straight from capacity to structure, really understand what's happening at each and every, um, case in a sense. What we can also do is we can sort of leave it for two years and run it then. See what happens to these batteries after we left it for two years. We can look at these batteries at a higher temperature, right? So uh, we can really see both in terms of charge discharge, composite, so composition, potential, storage, temperature, right? So we can really work in a very large parameter space to understand what's happening um, at that material level in devices. So we've done some commercial examples as well. So this is some work with Volvo um, and this is some work with um, valence technologies, essentially trying to think about how temperature affects the battery, right? In terms of current and temperature and how um, we can start to think about state of health uh, with structural parameters that we probe, okay? So we thought we'd heard a talk about sodium ion batteries and these, these, these are one of the reasons why one might want to do sodium ion batteries is for things like this. So this was the largest battery in the world in South Australia, the Tesla Hornsdale power plant, uh, energy storage battery. However, it's been superseded now, um, but yeah, it's, it was an example of a really big battery where sodium ion batteries probably would have been better than lithium ion batteries. Uh, there's other technologies out there such as lithium sulfur, so uh, we're working on lithium sulfur rich polymers. We're also looking at waste materials to get uh, lithium sulfur uh, based components out. Um, so in terms of uh, sodium ion batteries, um, 
what we're looking at is uh, these are some layered compounds, or these are sorry, some compounds that we've worked on in the past. And I'm just going to talk about this one and this one. I do apologize for the noise in, my, in the background. My kids have just arrived home. Um, so the idea here is, can we locate sodium um, using synchrotron X-ray diffraction? And we can. So what we're doing here is we're actually probing the lattice and sodium evolution in solid solution regions. And what you see here is we're charging and discharging, and you can actually see the volume change on this material, right? Um, and you can actually track where the sodium comes out of and goes into in these materials, right? So you can actually see how the sodium on these two sites evolve as you charge and discharge, okay? All right, so what's interesting about this is when you have a look at the sodium sites and the capacity, you can do different cycling steps and then you can probe how the sodium on each site evolves. And if you add those two together, you basically get what you expect. As you charge, the sodium drops. As you discharge, the sodium increase. So you're actually watching the sodium content in the cathode evolve as we charge and discharge. I think someone's got their microphone on, but I'll keep going. Um, and you can do this in terms of different polymorphs, different, different compositions, uh, looking at different compositions in a solid solution, looking at the hydration, uh, looking at compositions. I'd like to just spend a little bit of time here on these, these really fast experiments, right? If we look at applied current, we're now no longer looking at in situ experiments as a function of charge and discharge, but at different current rates. And so this is something beautiful. You can sort of see this is similar as last time. If we're looking at charge, discharge, charge, discharge, charge, discharge, what we're doing here is we're looking at faster current rates and we're also looking at higher potentials, right? So we can actually look at what changing the potential window as well as changing the current density or the current rate does, right? And you can sort of see if you go to higher potential here, see this, this thing here is quite different to this up here, right? You actually lose the structure here for a while, whereas it's still present here, right? And then you can order, identify unusual reflections like re ordering reflections at the charge state, various things like that. Identify the phases that are present, um, identify the regions which are unusual, all that sort of stuff. Here's another example where we have the stacking axis. And if you charge and discharge, if you charge really slowly, you have stacking faults in here and you lose the structure. If you go faster and faster, you go through different phase transitions, which is quite powerful in, in this sense. You can actually see how the current rate really affects your structure. And so this is an example of a really fast experiment where we were getting data at 45 seconds per data set, right? Um, and we're looking at sort of 4,000 data sets as we charge and discharge. So as we increase the current rate, we get faster and faster and faster. You can see the structure changes less. And that's because we're getting a smaller capacity. And what we can then do is we can then fit, this is the cell volume and the sodium concentration. You can fit lines to that so you can fit trends. And then you can have a look at kinetic parameters, volume change, sodium in. So as you put sodium in, how much does the volume change or the rate of change of volume as a function of rate of change of sodium? It's a very powerful work there, I think. So I've been quite quick, a um, bit of a sort of a few examples. In situ is fun, great experiments. Let's have a look at some of the techniques we use um, and some of the samples. So we've been looking at these um, sulfur, lithium sulfur samples. Uh, what we find is this is reported in uh, Nature in 2013. We find that this composition that they report is actually three components, and you can use a combination of solid state NMR, so lithium hydrogen, lithium uh, hydrogen carbon, and lithium lithium NMR, and coupled with soft X ray absorption spectroscopy and um, SEM to really understand what is happening on that lithium site. So, this is a local picture of where the lithium goes in these polymeric units quite powerful. Um, we're looking at some solar batteries. So this, uh, this idea here is you use light to both generate current as well as store um, uh, ions, right? So it's a dual purpose electrode. So it's both a, a solar cell as well as a solar battery. It works okay for a solar cell. As a solar battery, it's not so good. The storage is very low, but in principle, it works. Um, 
there's a lot of work my colleague does in proton batteries, right? The idea that we can actually uh, intercalate protons instead of uh, lithium is quite interesting and it's, it's quite diverse. Um, and so this is some of the work that we've been doing in that space. We are looking at recycling. So we've got old batteries. How do we get the recycled, essentially cathode anode mix into a new version of a battery, right? A second life battery. How do we do this? How do we do this without going back down to base metals? Um, and can we process this and make it much more um, powerful in that sense? And we're also looking at waste streams and converting waste streams into viable electrode materials. So using plastic wastes, uh, heating them up, and then potentially making activated carbons out of these. Okay, so it's quite exciting. Um, this is some tomography we've been doing on lead acid batteries, right? Um, we've done some tomography on um, uh, supercapacitors as well. So this is some lead acid battery work we're doing. Um, and this is my group, previous members, new members. Uh, they did all of the work. I just am the poster boy. So they do all the work and I just talk about all the work they do. Um, it's a fantastic group. I really appreciate what they've been doing. And finally, I'd like you to welcome you all in person, hopefully, maybe hybrid, but in person to Sydney next year, if you're uh, available and would like to come. We're hosting the International Meeting on Lithium Batteries, probably the biggest battery or the most pertinent battery meeting in the world. Um, and we'd love to see you all there. Uh, the abstracts are open, submit some posts, submit some abstracts, please. We have our um, conference lineup set up, leaders in the field. It'd be lovely if you're interested in lithium mine battery research or battery research per se, come along. We're gonna have sessions on sodium, lithium, the whole works. So with that, thank you very much for your time. Hey, thank you very much for the amazing uh, lecture with Professor Niraj. It's a very new uh, knowledge uh, for us. And yeah, we hope we can also uh, participate in your event for International Convention Center Sydney next year. Yeah, hopefully we can also uh, be there in person. <laughs> That'd be great. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So uh, we go to the uh, question and answer uh, session. So for